I'm Richard Wilson, and I'm on a driving tour of the UK. And the thing about the country lanes is that you never know what you're going to see when you go around the corner. But I'm doing it without the aid of modern technology. No sat-nav for me. Very twisty, twisty turny. I'm using the rather splendid collection of shell guides, first published in the 1930s, to see how Britain has changed over the decades. The shell guides sent you round the counties of Britain and mapped out where to go, things to do, and even what to eat. When they first appeared, going for a drive was a pleasurable experience. Uh, oh, mammy, daddy. Something that's harder to accomplish today. Good, wait, 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 good, I'm trying to reverse. Oh, shit. But I'm sure that me and my Daimler, which I have christened Deborah, will get us where we need to go. Today, I'm in Dorset in the southwest of England using the 1936 guide written by Paul Nash, a county with a coastline dating back millions of years, magnificent landscapes, and some of the most beautiful beaches in Britain. I'm choosing to follow the guide's recommendations around the south and travelling from east to west. I'm sailing across Poole Harbour to Swanage before heading to Lulworth Cove and then on to Dorchester. It's obvious when you read the 1936 Shell Guide to Dorset that the author, Paul Nash, loved Dorset. And the overriding impression he had of the place was a land of distant time. But he was worried uh, that Dorset might be ruined by developers. I'm going to follow the guide and go to some of the places that Nash enjoyed this window into the past to see if his worries were justified. The guide says the coast is the most compelling feature of the county and it's a good place to begin my adventure. The ferry runs across Pool Harbour to Studland, and the quick five-minute trip cuts out a 25-mile journey around the bay. The first guide to Dorset was written in 1936. The car ferry was already in existence at that time, and he even puts in a handy little timetable at the back. It used to run twice an hour. Now it runs three times an hour. Considering there are so many more cars on the road, that's not such a big change. Well, that was the quickest ferry I've ever been on. I'm driving three miles along the aptly named Ferry Road to Studland Beach, which the Shell Guide describes as undisturbed, quiet and lovely. Growing up on the banks of the River Clyde in Scotland, I love being near water. This is one of Dorset's finest beaches. It seems to go on for miles and miles and miles. There are very few locals about. Ah, he looks a friendly chap. Hello. Hello. Wait a minute. He's nude. You must be a, a naturist. I am that? indeed, yeah. Or a nudist. Yes. And what are you doing nude today in this freezing weather? Uh, well, I wouldn't say it's that freezing. There's some sunshine and it's quite, it can be quite warm. Oh, well, you're a brave man. Oh, yeah. Lots and you've got nothing on underneath that towel. Nothing at all, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very nice to meet you. I will Thank keep you. you. OK. You want to either go in there or go and get dressed? Yes. Uh, well, you never know. I might try the water. Thanks very much. Thank you. Rather him than me. Think I'll keep all my wrinkly bits under wraps. I need a cupboard to warm up after that. Nash doesn't mention anything here about nudists. I have a feeling he wouldn't have approved. My encounter on the beach reminds me of a quirky section of the guy devoted to a giant ball. Shell commissioned the up-and-coming artists of the day to design posters to encourage people to take to the road, and the globe appeared memorably in a 1932 poster. I've driven a few miles along the Ulwell Road to Swanage to see the great globe at Austin Country Park. 
Built in 1887, it's one of the largest spheres in the world and it weighs in at a hefty 40 tons. It's made up of 15 pieces of Portland stone. The Great Globe owes its existence to a local Victorian businessman, George Burt, who made his fortune in London and wanted to give something back to his hometown. Now, what's this concrete slab? Persons anxious to write their names will please do so on this stone only. Ah, well, that's obviously to stop people writing on the sphere. So since I'm here, it feels deliciously naughty indulging in a spot of graffiti. I could get a taste for this. My memories of Swanage will be ones of big balls and nudists. Following the guide, I'm heading further west along the coast to view Nash's promise of Lulworth Cove and to catch my first sight of the Jurassic Coast. I'm really looking forward to seeing it for the first time. Uh, the guide was describing Lulworth Cove as one of the most impressive and charming spots in Dorset. Long famous as a beauty spot, it deserves all homage. So, if I don't like it, <laughs> I could have been in trouble. In the guide, Nash wrote about the many wonders along the 95-mile stretch of coastline, including stair hole and the theatrical phenomenon of Durdle Door. But he was really impressed by the Jurassic Coast and the wealth of fossil remains to be found here. Local geologist Richard Edmonds is here to tell me more. The Jurassic Coast is a world heritage. Mm. When did that happen? So 2001, and that's because we've got 70 million years here, but the whole Jurassic Coast records 185 million years of geological time. And what we have is this complete record through the Triassic and the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. And there's nowhere else in the world where you can walk along a 95-mile section of coast and walk through that 185 million really? years of nowhere time. Nowhere in the world? Nowhere else in the world. It's incomprehensible. It is, it is, it's a, it's a very but not hard... to you. Well, yeah, we get very used to it, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So is it possible that underneath all that lot somewhere there are lots of huge things to be found? But there are, there are fossils along the, the whole length of the coastline. I realise my life has been missing something. <laughs> the Jurassic Coast is certainly a window into an ancient world. And I'm sure Nash would be delighted to know that nearly 80 years after he wrote the guide, it hasn't been affected by developers, and now never will be. Lulworth Cove has looked the same for millions of years, but there is one man who is taking the natural elements and creating something quite extraordinary. Adrian Gray is an artist and pioneer of stone balancing art, he spends hours scouring nearby beaches to select rocks to create stunning sculptures. This balancing act is extraordinary. So you've got to find the crunch point, is it? Yeah, where? exactly. Can I'm... you feel it? You can feel it. Exactly. I'm kind of listening with my fingers. So listening with your fingers. Yeah, I'm just making listening my with adjustment. his fingers. Until I find that. Now there's a there's a thing you haven't heard. For a while. I'm a little bit wary of the breeze at the moment. Look at that! It defies gravity. The stones are perfectly balanced. Amazing. Have you got to be an expert to do this? Well... Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the thing is, everyone can balance things. It's kind of instinctive. Um, but what I'm doing here, hopefully, is that I'm creating sculptures that have an intrinsic beauty. Um, a lot of people said they find them quite calming to look at. The only thing about it is, it is very calming to look at. <laughs> yeah. But then, if you realise, a tuft of wind can blow it away. Ah, yeah. So what I do is, um, uh, I fix them permanently. If, ah. if someone wants one, I will fix it permanently. Adrian's work is extraordinarily beautiful, and it's incredible how his modern art blends in with the ancient landscape. See, it takes... It's really... Quite firm. Oh! Oops, time for a speedy exit. The, the Jurassic Coast, what I've seen of it so far, is absolutely spectacular. But it's farewell to the coast for the moment. 
Next time off to inland Dorset and Hardy country. I'm Richard Wilson and I'm exploring Dorset without a sat-nav. Instead, I'm using the 1936 shell guide written by Paul Nash. The next part of my journey takes me to the home of Thomas Hardy in Dorchester and back to the coast to discover relics even older than me. The author, Paul Nash, loved Dorset. He thought it was a window into an ancient time, but he was also worried it might fall foul of the developer's bulldozer. Nash wasn't the first to worry about the beauty of this county being under threat. A hundred years before him, one of Dorset's most famous authors, Thomas Hardy, was writing about the same thing. Hardy was deeply concerned about the impact of the modern world and how it might affect his much-loved Dorset. I'm going to Hardy's hometown of Dorchester, which the guide describes as an imposing, attractive town. I'm on the A352 to see if it still is. And it's a rather charming little town. Uh, very individual, not taken over by high street giants. I'm meeting Alistair Chisholm, an expert on Hardy, who's going to show me where he lived and worked. God save the Queen! But first, I've agreed to pick him up from his day job. Hardy himself was born just three miles away in a delightful cottage, which you should visit, Richard. Well... And then, of course, this was the town in which he grew up, in which he went to school, where he was apprenticed as an architect and so on. It's slow progress back to the car. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> How do you do? I do do. The price right. of fame. Now, come on, smile uh, for me. And I'll take it back to Yorkshire. Oh, I thought it was oh, me she wanted to do. Yeah, he's come along with <laughs> Say cheese. Cheese. Is this That's Friday? It is. Friday. You know, is it? Is it, it? It is. It is. It is. It's not a look-alike. It's a real thing. <laughs> it is, isn't it? It is. It's, 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 I, I told it's his the voice. favourite. It's the, the voice. voice. It's the voice. Hello. Oh, it's my husband's favourite. Oh. Your husband's oh, favourite. You don't. Oh, you don't you're not particularly keen. If you were still, oh, yes, you were still alive. Oh, I loved your programme. <laughs> oh, oh, some take a photograph. Oh. Oh, you are going to take That's a photograph. Oh, it's going to Oh, it's well, I that. Are you coming into it? Oh, of course. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> Not having that. Be careful, Eileen. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. I'm still not entirely sure if they knew who I was. Finally, we're off on the A35 to the tiny hamlet of Higher Bockhampton, where Hardy lived. It's a delightful cottage, as you see. Have you not you've not visited it no. before? No. Well, this you it will it lives up to its reputation. It is um, still comparatively isolated. There have been times of my solo journey when I wish for some company, but you know the old saying: "Be careful what you wish for." It changes the names of places, as you well know. So you know, Dorchester becomes Casterbridge, Bournemouth becomes Sandbourne, and so on. Will he ever stop? He didn't like to be touched. Uh, oh, really? Um, and I think that is something that if you acquire celebrity, as you will know yourself, uh, people like to get up close, you know they what I mean? Do. He's uh, got something to say about everything. And we're going to turn left at this crossroads. Ah, at last we are there. Where are you? Ooh. This is the back of the cottage, Alistair. This is the back, yes. And on the other side, strangely enough, is the front. <laughs> Isn't acute observation a wonderful thing? What room are we going to look at first, Alistair? I think we'll look at the room to the left, Richard, the parlour. Yeah. If there was going to be any fun or a party or a dance, this being the largest room would have been where it was. After Alistair's grandstand performance on the way here, the actual house seems a bit of a come down. So this would have been the, uh, the office. Yeah. And there's no habitation for at least three miles. You walk across the heath and then you come to um, Puddletown, or as Hardy calls it, Weatherbury. Oh, violins. Yeah. I mean, they're there to remind visitors of just how important music was, and yeah. Thomas himself played that. Alistair's a true Dorset character. He really knows his stuff, and it's wonderful to see that Hardy's house has been lovingly preserved and has escaped the clutches of developers. 
Ah, the tranquility of solitude. I was talking to Alistair, and I said I was reading uh, The Return of the Native. He said, oh, that's hard going at the beginning. Um, so I'm, I've decided to move on to the mayor of Casterbridge. It's much more accessible. And so, yes, I, I am becoming a bit more of a hardy fan. Look at this. I mean, this is beautiful. That's and spoiled, a lovely undulating countryside. I love the guy to Dorset. Nash put a picture of a dinosaur on the first page as a reminder that they were the original inhabitants of this county. And I'm heading back to the coast to Osmington to meet a man who came face to face with Dorset's past and the find of a lifetime, Kevin Sheehan, beachcomber and fossil hunter. I've been blown away. I think the best idea is, rather than trek all the way down there, is to wait for him to climb up. Kevin! <laughs> Hello! <laughs> Lovely to meet you. And you, I'm Richard. Nice to meet you. How are you? Not too bad. Come down the cap. Come down, oh, I thought you were going to say come down the cliff. <laughs> After you. Oh, my goodness. Gosh. Come and sit in here and see. Large it. bricks, one in six. Small. Well, if you have the right money, you can have the... Oh, well, that's ice cream, I think. Selling bricks. I love places like this, eccentric and very British. So Down you're there. a bit of a magpie? Yeah. Oh, yeah, if it's not nailed down, it's mine. Uh, Can I touch it? Yeah, please. What is it? That's is an it? ammonite. It's a large aquatic snail. How old would this be? Uh, probably about 100 million years old. 100 million years? Oh, that really is old. Yeah. But that is a nautilus. Ah, a marine mollusk. That's not a face, is it? No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was an eye. Now that is a tooth of one of these large marine reptiles. It'll be about that length. And what's this bit in there? That's the nerve. The nerve? I found it in two inches of water. Five years ago, Kevin hit the fossil hunter's jackpot. He now has an extinct species named after him, Pleosaurus kevani. Uh, what about this... Dinosaur you found? Well, it just so happens I've got a picture of it here. <laughs> <laughs> that's it's one I made that's earlier. Handy. That's the beast. Gosh. Now, what, what is it? It's a pleosaur. It's uh, the largest of the marine reptiles. And this is a particular nasty beast. So how long would that whole animal be? I would say by the length of a, a London bus. It would be huge. It took Kevin five years to find, excavate, and assemble all the bits of the skull before he sold it to the museum in Dorchester. Are we allowed to ask what you got for it? Yeah, you can ask me. <laughs> what did you get? <laughs> I got ten grand for it. Ten grand. Ten grand for old bones. I wish my rate was that high. And is this the museum's best piece now? It's their pride of place, yeah. You know, what a thrill, having met you and I met Attenborough, so it's... <laughs> I wouldn't say my life's complete, but it's, I'm, it's good fun. <laughs> Mentioned in the same breath as an Attenborough, that's high praise. Nash was worried about preservation. Uh, but of course, preservation is not just about buildings. As an actor, it's the loss of ancient dialects that worries me. So I've arranged to meet someone who's keeping the ancient Dorset language alive. And he's promised to buy me a pint. Hello. Hello. Hi, nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Richard. Hi, how are you doing? Bonnie Sarton has lived in Dorset all his life. For the last 50 years, he's been the front man of a folk band, the Yetis. He's something of a custodian of local dialect, versions of which are still spoken today. This is very nice. Cheers. Good. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Yeah. I've got a little passage from Under Greenwood Tree by Thomas Hardy, yeah. which I would like to read you. I suspect you to answer questions on this later on, okay, <laughs> and do it properly. <laughs> okay, right. you can try me. Uh, righty ho. I was sitting, eating fried liver and lights. I well can mind how I was, and to save my life, I couldn't help chawing to the tune. I shall never forget that there band. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I, I think I understood that. You, I'm pleased about that. Uh, pretty well, by and large. In his guide, uh, Paul Nash says, Dorsetshire has a distinctive tongue to this day. That is to say, it has the individuality that the voice of a foxhound may be said to possess 
over the voice of other dogs. <laughs> I'm not sure I like the comparison, but, but yeah, we do. it is a distinctive accent. But you've got to learn to count, of course. One, oh. one two, three. What, three? Four. Four. Five. Five. Six. <laughs> six. Seven. Seven. Eight. Eight. Nine. Nine. And ten. Ten. You, yeah, you passed. <laughs> when, do you, when do you want your certificate? <laughs> oh, no, I'm not very good at accents. <laughs> The Dorset dialect is a bit of a tongue twister, but fantastic that it's being kept alive. When Nash wrote the Shell Guide, he was concerned that development might rob this country of its beauty. Well, from the places he recommended, the developers have been held at bay, and his window into an ancient world is flourishing and protected forevermore. This is the most beautiful aspect. And I could ha stand here for hours. Uh, not that I'm going to. Next time, I meet some lovely Essex girls. You've all got your ice cream. Don't share my yeah. ice cream with you. <laughs> Go out on a boat and eat the catch of the day. This was probably caught just out here but find it difficult to navigate on land. Are the Roman remains up here? They're not up here. No, oh, somebody sent me on a wild goose chase. Well, tomorrow night on ITV, we're heading to Africa with Paul O'Grady and all new animal orphans at nine. Next tonight, will anyone come out of the crash alive? We're back to Coronation Street to find out. Then Ellie has to face her own demons as the brand new series of Broadchurch continues in just half an hour.